everybody. Welcome to another installment of Glen Eagles University via Zoom. And it's a Monday night, and, and I appreciate so many of you joining us. We usually have these on Thursday nights, but there's, there's always a good time to learn something new. And we have Annette um, Isaacs, and she's uh, streaming to us via Zoom from Fort Myers, Florida. Yeah. And uh, she, is, uh, she just got off a Zoom call from Colorado, so she's all over the country. Right. And I just, uh, I want her to introduce herself, tell us all about her. And everybody, thank you again for joining us. And this will, this is recorded, so you'll be able to see it on our YouTube archives. Thanks, I, Mrs. Isn't, <laughs> Mrs. Isaac. Thank you so much, Tammy, and thank you, everybody, for signing on. And of course, as you can tell by my accent, I am a German woman. I am a German historian and a public educator. I was born in Germany. I grew up there, but I did get a scholarship to go to Emory University. So and that, of course, is, as you know, in Atlanta. So I was there for my first year of graduate school. Then I thought, I'm not going back to Germany. So I got another scholarship and I went to the university. University of Vienna, which was lots of fun because they have such great, um, uh, yeah, great um, desserts. <laughs> so I ate a lot of desserts. And then I came to Berlin. And then in Berlin, I uh, graduated with master's degrees in American studies, political science and history. And then I became the youngest country director of Road Scholar. At that time, uh, it was still called Elder Hostel. I worked for a company in New York, it was called uh, IST Cultural Tours, and they were Road Scholars' biggest program provider. And so I was responsible for the Germany programs, and I was stationed in Berlin for many, many years. And then I um, went to Chicago, and then I lived in Chicago in Evanston, very close to Northwestern University. And there I started my lecture business. And then just last uh, September, I'm, I mean, like, 13 months ago, I moved to Fort Myers because I got this really great opportunity to head a lifelong learning department of um, the second largest retirement community in the entire country. And so we have 2,600 residents and everybody is crazy about lifelong learning. And so I um, get to do, you know, I get to do my presentations, but I also get to create a lifelong learning program, which is really quite um, wonderful and really taps into all of my um, interests and of my, um, yeah, capabilities, let's say that. But today we are going to talk about a very fascinating topic and that is of course the rise and fall of the Berlin Wall. The thing about that is that it is timely uh, several uh, in, in several cases because the first one is that of course this year marks the 60th anniversary of the creation of the Berlin Wall, of the rise of the Berlin Wall. And then yesterday we in Germany we're celebrating the 31st anniversary of the German unification. So uh, to do this program today is uh, indeed very timely. Of course, nowadays, Germany is Europe's most populous nation. We have about 82 million people that live in Germany, and Germany is also Europe's most yeah, most successful economy, it's, its economic engine. But that wasn't always the case. So we have to, of course, start in the year 1945. So we all know Germany lost the Second World War. And as early as 1945, it was divided into, into these four occupation zones. And that happened at the Potsdam Conference in the summer of 1945. So what you can see here when it comes comes to that uh, to that brown area, that brown zone, that is the Russian zone. And that Russian zone, just four years after World War II, is going to turn into East Germany. And then we have, of course, the American sector or the American zone with southern Germany, with also a little bit of West Germany. Northern Germany went to the British. And then what kind of makes sense is the area that is uh, very close, you know, that is bordering France was going to become the French zone. Not only 
Germany as a whole was divided, but also Berlin as a capital city, capital city of Nazi Germany. And there you can see that the entire eastern part went to the Soviet Union and then the Western, uh, yeah, the so-called anti-Hitler coalition, the Western uh, allies were then getting West Germany. And only four years after the end of World War II, you already have the creation of two separate Germany. You have the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, or you would say the Federal Republic of Germany or West Germany. And that was happening in May of 1949. And then in uh, October of that same year, you have the Soviet zone of occupation that was transformed into the GDR or into East Germany. And here you see what that looked like. So you have obviously East Germany is much smaller than West Germany. And that, of course, had to do with the fact that East Germany really was only the Russian sector. And then what you see here in purple, that would be West Germany. In the 40 years of the existence of East Germany, East Germany only had about had two um, major leaders. One was this man that you see here to your right. Uh, that was Walter Ulbricht. The man that you see here to your left, maybe some of you remember him. He was quite a rascal. He was, of course, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who made life for your President uh, Kennedy very difficult. When Kennedy came to power in 1961, they had a they had uh, the, the summit of Vienna. And so uh, Khrushchev said to Kennedy, you are nothing but a boy in short pants, <laughs> which is not really a nice thing to say, as you can imagine. So this would be Walter Ulbricht to your right, who was the leader of East Germany from its inception, so from 1949 until the early 1970s. And then he was replaced by this man, Eric Honecker. And Eric Honecker, he was an interesting man. He was born in the Saarland. The Saarland is the area that borders France. So you cannot get more west than that. And then later on in his life, he became the leader of East Germany. So how interesting is that? And also, he was such a communist, basically, that he would always say, there's only one true Germany, which is my East Germany. And West Germany is nothing other than a fascist state and a capitalist foreign country. Imagine to say that about your own country. I mean, he was born there. He grew up in the, in the West. He also had quite the euphemism for the Berlin Wall. He never really referred to it as wall. He always said anti-fascist protection barrier. So we in East Germany, we have to protect ourselves from those fascist people in the West. He also, nowadays, you could tell, you could call him the project, project manager of the Berlin Wall, because he in 1961, when the wall is coming into effect, he's the one who is kind of spearheading this whole uh, project. He wasn't the leader yet because he was only, he was becoming the leader of East Germany in 72. So at, in 61, he was already part of the government, but in a different position. So what we have already established is already four years after the end of World War II, we already have two separate Germanys. When we talk about the capital cities, also very interesting. West Germany's capital is Bonn, which is a city near Düsseldorf, near Cologne, there in Western Germany. And then East Berlin is the capital city of East Germany. The population, of course, now you know that it does make sense a lot that East Germany is way littler than West Germany, 60 million as opposed to 16 million. And the political system is a democracy with political parties in the West, and then basically a dictatorship uh, in the East. And uh, sometimes, you know, when you look at that word dictatorship, you think, uh oh, 
that was not there. Wasn't dictatorship a little bit earlier? Wasn't that the one with Hitler? Well, yes, of course, but historians, after 30 years now of the end you know, of East Germany, historians have come to the conclusion that East Germany also was a dictatorship. While Nazi Germany was a right-wing dictatorship, East Germany was a left-wing dictatorship. Because from 1952 on, this party that you see here, the SED, was the only party that was allowed. The Socialist Unity Party was the only one that was allowed uh, in East Germany. So now something very interesting is happening. 1952 is a year before Stalin dies. He dies in 1953. 1952, he looks at the situation in Germany and thinks, I don't like the fact that so many East Germans are going to West Germany. Like people from Dresden, people from Leipzig, you know, because people didn't want to live in socialist, uh, in a socialist country. So he then says, I want a wall between East and West Germany. I want to make that border between the Russian zone and the uh, Western zones, I want to make that impenetrable. And that is what happens in 1952. And that is what you see here with that yellow and red area there. And this was a wall, the so-called inner border, uh, inner German border, the Grenze. And this is something that not everybody knows. Everybody, of course, knows about the Berlin Wall, but not everybody knows that there was also a wall that divided East and West Germany. And that is a wall that was 852 miles long. And you can see that it was up there, starting at the Baltic Sea and coming down to the Bavarian Forest. And that, of course, is a big game changer because now the people who usually would go, you know, from one side to the other can't do it anymore. And that is why Berlin becomes so important. Berlin is becoming a perfect escape hatch because Berlin, the Berlin Wall is only happening in 61. We're now in 52. So we have nine years where people are actually able to go from East Germany through East Berlin, you know, through this, these checkpoints, you know, that they had several checkpoints. And you, of course, are mostly familiar with Checkpoint Charlie that would, would have been responsible for you if you had wanted to go. And then they would be in West Berlin. And then once in West Berlin, they would go to this. They would go to a refugee camp. This is the refugee camp in Berlin Marienfelde, which is in the far west of West Berlin. And this was the biggest one, actually. Um, so they had several, but this was the biggest one. And in those nine years between that creation of that inner German wall and then the Berlin Wall, you had over one million people that were kind of administered there, that were coming, for, that were going from one part to the other. So, for example, you know, if you wanted, to, you were staying there, and then of course you were asked, so what, do, what are your your plans? What do you want to do? Are you going to stay in West Berlin, maybe, or are you going to go to other German cities? If they wanted to go to other German cities, they would have to be flown out. Because you can't, if you want to go to, uh, to um, uh, because, you know, the idea that Berlin is, of course, in the middle of East Germany, you can't go back to East Germany, you know, in order to go down to Munich or so. So that's why they had to be flown out. Or if they wanted to stay in West Berlin and make a life there, they could, of course, do that. So the problem with that is that if you are a East German politician, you're looking at this and you're realizing, wow, in those years, 2.3 million people are leaving. You know, from 1952 to 61, you have 2.3 million people who left East Germany. And this is like 20% of its po total population. East Germany stood on the brink of an economic ruin because it was mostly young people who left. 50% of them were under 25 years old. And they, of course, were teachers. They were, you know, students. They were maybe engineers and so on. And so they took their work power with them and made the West even more successful. So in the minds of the socialist leaders, something had to be done in order to prevent these people from leaving the country. 
and this is what was done. So you have, of course, Evan Conacher, who is the, as a, for lack of a better word, like a um, project manager of it. So he decides, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do this on a Sunday. Uh, nobody's working on a Sunday, so uh, we will have, uh, you know, uh, time uh, and very uh, empty streets. We're going to do it in the morning. We're going to start at 2 a.m. And the first thing you have to do, because, you know, if you want to build a wall, you can't build it overnight. You, of course, have to have, uh, you have, have to do it in phases. So the first phase was to, at 2 a.m. in the morning, close up, you know, kind of um, cut through all the streets and intersections that were leading from the east to the west, and they were altogether 191 streets and intersections, you have to uh, cut them with that, with barbed wire. And that's exactly what they did. And look what I have. This is incredible. This was just given to me maybe um, three or four weeks ago from one of my um, uh, yeah, people who also work here because his father uh, was stationed in Berlin and he kind of got hold of this. This is the original barbed wire from the Berlin Wall. So I think that that's incredible that he gave that to me. So yes, so this is what that is. So then, of course, if you wanted to leave, now that is the day that you do it, right? You know, because here this lady, as you can see, she just kind of had to jump over the barbed wire. And that, you can imagine, was one of the best decisions that she has ever made. Look at this, though. You have, when you are going to build the wall, you're going to have streets where one part is going to be in the east and the other part is going to be in the west. And one of the most famous streets was the Bernauer Straße. And you see this family that um, have, has heard, you know, this is what's going to happen. So that is why they take whatever they can get, you know, they grab whatever they can find, and they run from one part of the street to the other. And so that is what you see here. That young girl here, that she was 16 at the time, you know, with the white blouse that is uh, coming at us there. She now is 76, and they interviewed her just a few months ago, and she still lives in Berlin. And so I thought that that was neat. She still has short hair. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, she, she's doing well. So then you had a couple of uh, days later, they were exchanging the wire knitting fence. No, no, the barbed wire for wire knitting fence. So this is this one. And then this picture was taken on the 18th of August. So this is five days into the entire um, operation. And there you can see, of course, how they're building it with the stones. And of course, how sad, you know, if you take a look at this picture, you see that there's this family, you know, they just had twins and they're showing off their twins, you know, to the relatives in the East. But, you know, to everybody, you know, look, Berlin was the biggest city in all of Germany. You have two million people in the West. You have one million people in the East. Everybody was in one way or another connected. And so uh, that was not enough, you know, for the East German leadership to cause so much heartbreak. They even did some more by actually uh, relocating everybody who was living close to the wall, you know, because they, of course, were afraid that people could maybe jump over it or have like ladders and uh, go over it. So that's why everybody who lived close to that wall was forcefully resettled. And so here, look at this picture. The first thing you see is that you have the uh, brick layer. And the brick layer is, of course, uh, closing up the window there. But if you take a look to the left, you see him. You see a policeman. So there's this policeman who has a watchful eye when it comes to that brick layer because we don't want the brick layer to jump over the wall. And then after all the work was done, Bernauer Straße looked like this. Isn't that just the most horrific picture of them all? So. The reactions to the wall were, of course, shock, horror, and disbelief. The New York Times, as you can see here, was talking about it. As Soviet troops encircle Berlin to back up ceiling of border, U.S. drafting vigorous protest. But, you know, the protest was mostly verbal. 
And the person who wrote this article, he also wrote about the, the mood in Berlin. And he said, the mood of Berlin controlled fury. Very interesting. So five days after this article was published, guess who was there? Lyndon Baines Johnson, your vice president. Kennedy did not come to Berlin yet. He came a little later. But on August 19th, 1961, you have LBJ coming to Berlin. And he did his best to yeah, dispense some comfort uh, to the Berliners. And he said, and I quote, because that's important, he said, I understand the pain and outrage you feel. This island does not stand alone. You are a vital part of the whole free community of free men. Very interesting. Kennedy, as we know, did come. Very, very world famous. He came two years later. He came on June 26, 1963. And of course, he is extremely famous for having said, Ich bin ein Berliner. Why did he say that? Because he wasn't, we know he wasn't from Berlin. Well, actually, let's think about, you know, the, the context in which he said it. He actually is really there in order to align Berlin, West Berlin, with this notion of freedom, you know, to align it with America. And so he says, all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. So then we have a situation that, yeah, the East Germans haven't realized that now, since they have kind of, um, uh, yeah, uh, upset everybody else, you know, also the West Germans, uh, who's going to pay the money, who's going to kind of support them. They, are, they then realized like a little bit later that if you want to buy commodities, like for example, oil, you need US dollars or Deutschmarks. The oil sheiks or oil, oil sheiks in Saudi Arabia are not going to, to take their inferior East German mark. So that's why in 1963, they come up with this ploy, this kind of nowadays we would say pay to play. <laughs> so this idea of they are kind of selling access to East Germany for West Berliners. So the West Berliners were able to pay 25 marks, West German marks, of course, 25 marks for 24 hours in order to visit their relatives in the East. And that was always for every 25 hour, 24 hours. So if you wanted to stay for three days, it would have been 75 marks. If you wanted to stay for four days, it would have been 100 marks. So you get what the idea was. And so um, that was only going to happen uh, during Christmas time from 1963 to 1964. And look how many people took advantage of this travel regulation. There were altogether 700,000 people who wanted to do the, who, who wanted to visit their relatives. It was really uh, quite incredible. And then here we see the wall cutting through Berlin from the north to the south. So now I need to get my, let's see, this is my laser pointer. <laughs> Isn't Zoom wonderful? <laughs> oh, you yeah, have a laser pointer. So this is in the north, goes down to the south. This would be East Berlin. This would be West Berlin. So now out of, out of West Berlin there, here, for example, would be the city of Potsdam. Potsdam, very famous because of the Potsdam Conference. So what is Potsdam? Is it in the east or the west? In the east. So if that's the wall and this is east, so why don't the East Germans just hop over here? Because they can't. <laughs> the, the reason for the fact that they can't is that not only did the Berlin Wall cut through the city, but it also surrounded West Berlin. And that is why the Berlin Wall was 98 miles long. And that is why LBJ is talking about it as if it's an island. This island in the communist sea is not alone. West Berlin was surrounded by the Berlin Wall. Because everything else, this is East Germany and this is East Berlin. 
And so living in West Berlin was not for the faint of heart, although, of course, West Berlin was a member of the free world. It wasn't for the faint of heart. You had three transit highways. One would go to the north, one would go to, that would be Hamburg, one would go to the south, to Munich, one would go to the west, to Hanover. But... Ugh, you know, you have to go through East Germany. You have to wait for hours and hours. And everybody's looking at your car. They have these big mirrors that are put underneath your car. If you are traveling with a magazine, forget it. You know, I mean, it's, um, it wasn't easy. But here we have some interesting statistics. As I said, 98 miles, including 40 miles through built-up areas, 20 miles through woods, 15 miles through open terrain, and look, even rivers and lakes were fortified with a 23-mile water border. And here we see the wall, what it looked like in the area of Spandau. Very unattractive. And then here, this is from 1971, so that would be basically the 10th anniversary, uh, of the wall. And if you take a look at it, at first glance, it kind of looks as if it's from the Middle Ages, like, you know, these uh, city walls. But, uh, and the other thing that I also wanted to mention is that in a way, it is a little bit of a misnomer to say Berlin Wall, because one should say Berlin Walls with an S, because as you can see here, there are two. There is the Western Wall that is about nine feet tall, and it is capped with a white cylindrical uh, kind of pipe, in a way, in order to prevent an easy grip. And then behind it lies a strip of land, approximately 150 feet wide, and that is studded with barricades, watchtowers, guard dogs, landmines, all just horrible things. And that is known as the so-called death strip because the East German border guards are using their weapons, you know, to, of course, prevent people from leaving. And then to the east, too, the border is sealed by a wall. So you have the western wall, you have the death strip, and then you have the eastern wall. And now, of course, you can see there is no uh, jumping over that. You know, how are you going to do that? And that means that you have 16 million people that are, in a way, prisoners in their own country. And the one thing that the East Germans just kind of hated the most was these poor living standards. And, you know, the lack of food, the lack of variety. So here, for example, the standing in line, waiting periods. Standing in line was a big, you know, a, a defining aspect of life in East Germany. So here you can see, of course, people standing in line uh, at a fish store, then waiting periods, the waiting times in the GDR were incredible. Like, for example, let me give you some examples. You have the Trabi, that would be the East German car. Of course, it doesn't look like a Porsche or like a Mercedes or so, but that's the car that the East Germans really loved. I mean, because it's the only one that was available. <laughs> and so, um, yes, you could get it, but uh, can you just go? To this, if you have the money for it, can you just go to the store and get it? No, you have to wait until the government is uh, allocating one to you. And how long do you have to wait? Well, 15 to 18 years. So I always say, you know, when you're 18 years old, you can do your driver's license. And then on your 35th birthday, you have your car. The other thing was very priced possession was a telephone. Hmm, you get, is that easy to get? No. 20 years, up to 20 years, you have to wait for one. Or another thing, a new apartment. What about a new apartment? That would be nice because, you know, as you know, the East Germans, of course, were not benefiting from the Marshall Plan. Only the West Germans were. So East Germany was really not uh, recovering from the Second World War, certainly not as much and as rapidly as West Germany was. And so a lot of people were still sitting 
in apartments that were subpar. And so, you know, then in the late 60s and early 70s, the East German government came up with this idea of creating these, the so-called Plattenbau. Plattenbau meaning you have prefabricated slabs of concrete that are being put together in order to create this very, like, socialist style, this very socialist aesthetic. And if you have traveled in uh, East Germany or in Poland or in the Soviet Union, you know what that looks like. You know, there are these huge buildings and we in West Germany would call them um, human filing cabinets. Uh, but the East Germans loved them because they have they had central heating. They had all of that. You know, they had uh, bathrooms, you know. And so um, how long do you have to wait to get one of these apartments? Oh, forget it. You're not getting one of these apartments. You have to be a member of the Stasi, of the secret police, or you have to be a privileged person. You have to be a member of, you know, of uh, the East German government or whatever. Or you have to be like Katharina Witt. Do you remember her from the 1980s? She was this figure skater. And she was, uh, she was also known as the most beautiful face of socialism. <laughs> and so she, of course, she had one of these apartments. You better believe it. So here you have a very interesting statistic from 1989. When I show that, I always remind my audiences that it, this is not 1889. This is 1989. This is like uh, just like 32 years ago. And uh, so there you can see, you know, let's look at the toilet. That means that in one in four cases, you... Um, had to be very nice to your neighbor because you were sharing a toilet down the hall or warm water, 82%, or telephone, as I said, a very prized possession. Only 16% of apartments had that. But 46% were heated with coal-fired stoves, and that brought with it, you know, a lot of uh, problems, you know, when it comes to uh, yeah, pollution-related illnesses. People had asthma and all of that. It wasn't great. Take a look. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a city called Eisenach, and Eisenach is famous because of Martin Luther, because in 1521, Martin Luther was there uh, in, on a ca in a, uh, up there, there's a castle, and uh, the castle was called the Wartburg, and there he did, uh, yeah, he was um, kind of translating the Bible. So, and uh, if you take a look at this picture, you could think, oh, is that a picture from 1521? <laughs> no. uh, yeah, but there you can see this is what East Germany looked like. And this is also uh, a representative picture. And this is a picture from 1991. So you could tell where all that money, you know, that we had to generate for the unification and for the uh, kind of renovation of a whole country, where that came from or where, well, no, but not whatever, where that had to go, you know, because um, of course so much had to be put and in, um, and uh, invested into, uh, yeah, renovating East Germany. This is a picture of East Berlin from the year 1990. And these are pre-war apartments. So you will want to have a pre-war apartment because these are the ones, you know, that have the parquet floors, like the wooden floors and the high ceilings and the stucco. Um, and of course, nowadays, and this is like the the uh, I, I, the irony even of it all is that nowadays one of these is going to be a million bucks. <laughs> so uh, nowadays, you know, they are of course luxury, um, yeah, renovated and are f absolutely fabulous. But of course, in 1990, not so much. So before we go any further, we have to talk about the fact that East Germany had, oh, let's see. So, let's say this. Airwaves do not know any boundaries. And there were a lot of East Germans who were able to watch West German TV. It wasn't allowed, but they still could do it, especially the ones who were living in East Berlin. They were able to definitely watch West Berlin TV. TV. And then the people who were living close to that inner German border, they were also able, you know, with their antennas, they were able to get West German TV. And if we think back to the 1980s, what were the 1980s? They were a decade of, you know, when it comes to um, uh, yeah, popular culture, uh, it was uh, it was a, a decade of 
uh, yeah, celebrating excessive wealth. So everything when you uh, were, uh, of course, we all had American TV. And so we were watching Dallas. We were watching Dynasty. We were watching Falcon Crest, Heart to Heart. I mean, it seemed in the 80s that everybody who was on TV was a millionaire. So I grew up, you know, being a child in the 80s, I grew up thinking, oh, you know, every American has an oil field, <laughs> you know, because I was watching Dallas all the time. And so, yeah, and so that, of course, is something the East Germans, you know, are watching that. And that's their frame of reference. They're, they're looking at all of these rich people and they have Mercedeses, they have beautiful houses, and they are living in these things. So that's one thing that we can't really underestimate. The other thing is that when we talk about the Berlin Wall, we cannot talk about it as an isolated event. Because, of course, it was not only the fall of the wall, it was the fall of the entire East Bloc. And so just think of it. Think of like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Romania and of course the Soviet Union. All of these countries were falling by 1989. And there were things happening in the 1980s that were then um, kind of leading up to the to that important to these important events at the end of the decade and so the first one i would say is 1982 where the uh, the polish um, yeah uh, polish um, union leader lesz walosa is creating the solidarity movement yes of course he has to go to prison for a little bit but he's still you know there is kind of there are cracks in this iron curtain a little bit at least then of course a very important game changer 1985 you have Mikhail Gorbachev who comes to power and then when he is seeing the writing on the wall and he sees oh the that uh, Soviet Union is not really sustainable um, so then you know he uh, kind of applies his idea of glasnost perestroika to um, the whole situation and then of course you have him you have 1987, and that would be um, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan standing there in front of the wall uh, saying, uh, Secretary Gorbachev, if you want peace, if you want prosperity, tear down that wall. And when he said that, of course, no, everybody clapped, but nobody thought that that was going to be the case, that this was going to happen. But it did happen. And it started in 1989 with, in the summer of 1989, that Czechoslovakia and Hungary opened up their borders to Austria. And you might think, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's very interesting. Austria is, of course, a member of the free world. And the people in East Germany, they were not able to travel to Paris or London, but they were always able to travel within the East Bloc. So that is why in August of 1989, you have all of these East Germans who are traveling from East Germany to the um, uh, Austrian-Hungarian border, to the Austrian-Czechoslovakian border, and then they walk through and then they are in Austria. And of course, Austria being a member of the free world, all they have to do is take a car or a train and go uh, to Munich because it's very easy to do that from Austria, from Vienna to Munich. And then here we have the same picture of the East Germans in Prague also doing that same thing. And so in Germany, if you are a German person, doesn't matter if you're from the East or from the West, as long as you have, you know, um, German blood, you can go to a city hall and say, hi, I'm a German, this is my birth certificate. And then, uh, they are going to give you a German passport, which would be the West German passport, and see how happy they are with this. And so all of this is going on while, you know, the East Bloc, like Romania, Poland, everything is kind of falling apart, also the Soviet Union. And then we have Eric Honecker, who is 77 years old at the time, and who gets bad news from his doctor. And the news is that he has kidney cancer, 
And, you know, the other thing is, of course, that the East Germans are uh, meeting, you know, they are engaging in demonstrations. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm going, I'm resigning. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, I'm going to introduce you to your new leaders. They might all be 20 years younger than, than you, but they are also socialists. But the East Germans didn't want to have that anymore. And so look at this, this picture here. You see the Brandenburg Gate, and that is, of course, uh, bl blocking the approach. Uh, uh, let's say the wall is blocking the approach of the Brandenburg Gate. And that could have been taken on November 9th. It looks kind of odd to me. And so November 9th, 1989 was a Thursday. And what happened was this man here, Gunter Schabowski, he was in... He was the, uh, the, uh, the, the press secretary of the East German government. He woke up with a toothache. And so he uh, had to go to the dentist. And while he was at the dentist, he um, you know, missed a very important meeting of the East German leadership because the East German leadership decided that they were going to make concessions to the people of East Germany by telling them that they were going to be able to apply for visitors' visas. But the idea was just that to kind of build buy, uh, by themselves more time to kind of contemplate their next move. So they did not want to open up anything or something. They just thought, let's just tell the East Germans that they can apply for a visitors' visa. And then we give them like red tape, and then they're not going to want to do it anyway. <laughs> so then, unfortunately, the person person who was uh, writing the notes of this meeting, like the note taker, uh, wasn't particularly great at his job because when Günther Schabowski came back from the dentist, he was pushed into this international press conference that was, by the way, also attended by your Tom Brocko and Peter Jennings from your American TV. And so this was 90 minutes and it was the most boring thing you could ever imagine. And then after nine minutes, minutes, uh, 90 minutes, um, you have uh, Schabowski getting, uh, uh, reminding himself, oh yeah, I have this piece of paper here. And so he's reading this and he's saying, yeah, you know, we have decided that, you know, people can apply for visitors visas and then we're going to give them access, you know, to West Germany. And then, of course, all these journalists are looking at each other. And there's this Italian journalist who is raising his hand and who's saying, wait a minute, when is this going into effect? And Günther Schubowski looks at that piece of paper and doesn't know, you know, because it doesn't really tell him anything uh, very important. And so he says, I don't know, now? And of course, that was such a bombshell. And so all the journalists ran out of that room. And of course, this is before any iPhone. So they have to get like phones, you know, like um, uh, pay phones. And then at 8 p.m., on that day, you already have the West German TV newscast that is announcing the opening of the border, uh, DDR eröffnet Grenze. At the same time, the East German TV uh, news was saying, this is all a big mistake. We are not opening up anything. Please stay home because East Germans were already walking. You know, East Berliners were going to these checkpoints and were demanding, you know, they said it on TV and so on. And of course, nobody really watched East German TV because, you know, everybody watches West German TV. So then I'm going to show you a really sad photo of Günther Schabowski, <laughs> look at him, he's so pale because he's realizing what he has done. He has killed his own country in a way with this decision, you know, with, uh, or with, that, with that wrong information that, uh, that he was kind of getting out there. And so at around 10 p.m., uh, they uh, so there was there were so many people at these checkpoints that uh, they were pushing you know you know what a checkpoint looks like they they have this like wooden beam and everything so people were pushed to that wooden beam and people were coming from the back and so that is why the head of that um, of that um, checkpoint you know uh, was actually saying I can't do this anymore and he just opened up the wooden beam, and then like a floodgate, this turned to this. 
<laughs> and it was, of course, one of the most elating moments of the 20th century, especially for the Germans. And then here we have a picture that was taken the next day. And then look how happy everybody was. Wait, did I say everybody? No. <laughs> there were some who were not happy at all. And these are, of course, the border guards. And here we see them. They're not very friendly. So I have a very interesting number for you. 90% of all people of East Germany left East Germany on that first weekend. And you might say, what? What does that mean? Well, not to live in West Germany. It's maybe, I mean, I can imagine many, you know, brought, uh, did, like, you packed their bags, you know, and just wanted to get out of the East. But Mostly, it was really to see how the other half lives, you know, to kind of, um, kind of just drive from one side to the other, you know, and just take a look. And so here, look at that cute picture, because you see the first thing that we see here is that East German cars do not have a, um, a catalytic converter, obviously. So they are uh, responsible for our climate <laughs> crisis. <laughs> look at that. And then the other thing that we see is that, of course, they, they all have the same car and they are going on their way. They are on their way to Nuremberg, which is a good idea because Nuremberg is great. It's a wonderful city. So while they are driving around in West Germany, they're looking at the nice houses. They're looking at the nice cars. They're looking at the Mercedes's, at the Porsches. Then they look back at their cars. Then they look back at the Mercedes's, look back at their cars. And they say, I don't want my car. This is disgusting. I want a nice car. And so that is why many of these poor trubbies met the following fate. People were just putting them into the trash. So the question is, of course, did people in East Germany have any money? Well, I mean, they had a tiny bit. They had the so-called welcome money. And this is a, um, that was a gift that the, the West German government actually gave to the East Germans. And it was 100 marks per person. And that would have been like about 60 US dollars. And so for everybody. So if you were a husband and a wife, you had three children, you would get 500 marks. And if you do the math, you have 16 million people. Everybody gets 100 marks. About a, mil, about a billion US dollars that was sent from the West Germans to the East Germans just as a little welcome gift. And that is the first time that the generation of my parents were looking at this and were saying, wait a minute, what's happening with our taxpayers' money? Why is, the, why is that? Why are the people from um, uh, East Germany? Uh, somebody is not muted, I, I, th I think. That's why we have a little. Uh, the, yeah, so why are the, the people from East Germany having our money, <laughs> our West German money? And that is a discussion that has been going on for 30 years. So look at him, Ronald Reagan. Isn't that exciting? Ronald Reagan in 1990 was coming to Berlin to help dismantle those 98 miles of concrete that had to be uh, dismantled. But most of the job was, of course, done here by these soldiers. And then the whole year of 1990 was spent with the two plus four talks, the two Germanys and the four allied forces that were talking about, you know, how are we going to unify Germany. And then nowadays, of course, the wall is gone, but we have present reminders. So everywhere where the wall once ran, you have these two rows of cobblestones. And then here we see, I mean, we have a couple of uh, like wall pieces still standing. So here, this is what it looks like. This is from one of my former road scholar groups. And so here you see, that's what it looked like. Or nowadays, basically, it's very dilapidated. And so you can imagine if you have 98 miles of concrete that were leading you know, through this biggest city of Germany, uh, you are going to be left with great valuable uh, building uh, plots. And so that is why in the 1990s, Berlin became uh, the biggest construction site in all of 
rest of Europe. And I have brought some before and after pictures so that we can take a look at what is happening, uh, what, like, what happened before and what's happening now. So this is Potsdamer Platz when the wall was still up. And this area, and this is, um, it's called Potsdamer Platz, but it still is in Berlin. It's in downtown Berlin. And this is what it looks like now. Yeah, a lot of cars. Berlin has a lot of cars, but it's quite nice. So this is, of course, the Berlin Wall blocking the approach of the Brandenburg Gate. And this turned into this. And then here we have the area north of the Brandenburg Gate, where we now have fancy, ritzy apartment buildings. And then Checkpoint Charlie. That's always the question that audiences are asking me. What happened to Checkpoint Charlie? Well, I can tell you nothing. <laughs> we still have it. We would never get rid of Checkpoint Charlie. I mean, everybody who comes to Berlin wants to have a picture of Checkpoint Charlie. So, but when you think of it, how incredible, you know, the transformation of Berlin that has been going on in the last 30 years. And then, of course, what is happening with Berlin? Because Berlin never really had huge, I mean, let's say after the Second World War, Berlin didn't really have a lot of... Um, a lot of industry, you know, and so that is why they then decided, let's just be a tourism magnet. And that is what they, they are. Tourism is the biggest, um, yeah, biggest, in, biggest industry in Berlin. And you can imagine with the pandemic, it was, of course, very devastating. But Berlin also is, of course, our new capital city, you know, the old new capital city. We also have a, and I say this facetiously, a Silicon Valley. That's our version of it. It's a research compound where people, you know, very uh, smart people are thinking about new ideas. And let me just tell you, uh, if you have another minute, about the tourism. The thing is that not everybody who comes to Berlin has money and goes to a five-star hotel. In many cases, they are young people. They go to hostels, to youth hostels. And so they are these youth hostels that have been mushrooming, you know, uh, in these areas that are mostly also residential areas. And so they also have these apartment buildings that when, when somebody has an apartment and wants to make some uh, easy money, they would then turn them into a an Airbnb or into a vacation rental. And that, of course, is not good for the Berliners because we have such a housing shortage. And so they don't love it. And they also don't love that there are now these new bars and restaurants that cater to, to the tourists in areas that were formerly residential. So now uh, in uh, several of these windows, when you come to these areas, people have put a, a sign. And that's what the sign says. Welcome to Berlin. Now go home. <laughs> kind of cute. And then here we have another problem that you might also, um, of course, be familiar with gentrification. We have the, the rich people who come from southern Germany because our rich people always come from southern Germany, <laughs> you know, because that's where the money is. That's where the, um, the economic success is. It's in Munich. It's in Stuttgart, the car industry and everything. And so they have money and they come to Berlin, they buy, uh, buy these apartments, they renovate them. And then the people who had lived there, who had been living there for so many years, they can't afford it. And where do they have to, to move? To the human filing cabinets in the outskirts. And of course, I'm sure that nobody here would like to live in this. I mean, I certainly wouldn't. I would also uh, like to just take a look at this picture because we're going to just leave we're going to leave Berlin for a second and talk about Dresden because look how gorgeous this is when you take a look at this picture you see where all the money went right where the two trillion euros that we have spent so far on that unification where that went uh, in the renovation of these beautiful buildings but what you see here and this is a relatively new phenomenon is you have young Germans. Because the thing was 
that in the 1990s, because of the unification and the fact that the East German economy just flatlined and like over 80 percent of the East Germans lost their jobs, you had a, a mass migration of two million people who were mostly young people, well-educated people who left East Germany and who went to Southern Germany, to the aforementioned, you know, Munich or Dresden, because there they had many more opportunities when it comes to, you know, economic success. And only recently have we stopped this trend that people have left East Germany and that they are staying or they're even coming back. And that is a great sign, you know, that, but it was long, you know, 30 years after the unification. So then we have, of course, every time when we have a unification date or the Berlin, the fall of the Berlin Wall date, we have these these um, these uh, opinion polls, and so in a recent opinion poll, people were asked, "So, do you think that Germany is a unified country?" You have fifty percent who say yes, but forty-seven percent who say no. So it's really cut in the middle, and you see these. You know that only forty-five percent are saying that East and West Germans are treated equally. You have twenty-eight percent who say no, the West Germans are getting preferential treatment. You have 12% who say, no, the East Germans are getting preferential treatment. So there is still, you know, this kind of bickering. And then here, uh, people were asked, even 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the differences between East and West Germans are still very big. Do you agree? And 74% of the East Germans and 69% of the West Germans asked in this opinion poll agreed. And then this is an opinion poll that I thought was interesting because the question was, when you think back at the hopes you had during the time of the unification, do you think that these hopes were fulfilled? And the answer is 71% of the East Germans said yes. But that means that 29% of them said no. And we have to think about those 29%. We have to kind of take care of those 29% and kind of find out why. Because those 29% are going to vote, you know, for parties that are not very demo democratic. And so, um, because we just had an election just a couple of days ago, you know, like, like let's say a week ago. So I would say to you in order to kind of come to an end, and I hope that we do have some time for questions and answers, 31 years after the unification and 60 years, you know, after the creation of the wall, but then 32 years after the fall of the wall, yes, the people of East Germany still have a ways to go, but at least now they can pursue their own happiness and freedom in self-determination. And that, I think, and I'm, th and I'm sure that you will, uh, you will agree, you know, that's a good thing, you know, that they now can really kind of go their own path and that they are not uh, stuck there in this socialist country. So I thank you so much. Oh, see you next week. That, <laughs> that was not for you. <laughs> I thank you so much for your, ah, there it is, for your time and your attention. And I hope that you liked uh, learning about my home country. And I do have 30 different topics that I talk about. So we could talk about until the cows come home. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there and to see if you have any questions. You can put them in the chat. You can also unmute yourself. So tell me, how do you usually do that with questions? We do just exactly what you said. Sometimes huh. I'll put it in the chat. I usually start off, but I don't have any questions, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to rely <laughs> on you because this was an amazing topic. I think you covered so yeah. much. So please, somebody raise their hand or send in the chat. Or have, um, Yes, somebody said I have. I have a question. Ah, yes. As always, uh, in the recent elections, do you have any feel for how the people who live in East Germany voted as opposed to the people in West Germany, because there still is a that divide, as you pointed out. And there was a great big uh, hassle over the fact of Angela Merkel's party not getting the majority. 
Exactly. So the thing about Angela Merkel is that she is from East Germany. You know, that's so interesting. But she is, <laughs> she is loathed in East Germany. People in East Germany do not like her. And that the most important reason for that is 2015. And maybe some of you remember what happened there. That was the year when she opened up Germany to the one million Muslims, you know, that were coming in, uh, the people from uh, the war refugees from Syria, from Afghanistan, and so on, you know, from I Iraq, and uh, the East Germans, because you have to also see, you know, the East Germans, uh, first of all, it was a traumatic experience for them to go through the unification because many of them lost their jobs. All of a sudden, you know, they were kind of swallowed, if you will, by the much uh, more um, yeah, powerful uh, West Germany. And then the West Germans were coming into East Germany. They were closing, uh, uh, closing businesses left and right. And then, of course, um, you had, it, it was a a terrible experience for many of them, but also a good experience for young people, you know, because they were then the world was their oyster. They could go to the south. They could go to uh, all different countries, especially with the European Union. So, I mean, there's always there's always a segment of our population that is doing well, but then there's a big segment that didn't. And so Angela Merkel, for the longest time, always said, and of course, these are people who never, many of them never found another job. So Angela Merkel is saying, OK, so we're now doing austerity. We don't have any money. So you're going to get like $400, $500 a month, you know, in, um, in um, uh, unemployment or, you know, you get like ridiculous amounts, you know. Uh, and then every year they would, there, there's like this big commission and they're coming together and they're saying, okay, uh, yes, we know that the poor people of Germany need more money, mm, maybe like three euros more. You know, I mean, that's, that is, of course, what the, the East Germans are looking at this and are thinking, this is crazy, you know. Then, you have 2015. And in this whole idea of austerity, 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 comes the refugee crisis. And all of a sudden, Angela Merkel has 25 billion euros in order to house the refugees, in order to take care of the refugees, in order to give them a little stipend every month, and so on and so on. And that blew the East Germans' minds, you know. That is why they, then there is a, we, we have a right-wing party. It's called the Alternative for Germany. That is a party that uh, is uh, very powerful in East Germany. So and that's, you know, in 2017, when we had our last election, they had over 12% in our federal government, which, which was really a shock to everybody, uh, not to the East Germans, but of course to the West Germans. Um, but then nowadays, the AFD is still extremely big in East Germany. Uh, they have like maybe some, sometimes 28%. They are in all the states, you know, they, we have like five states in East Germany. They are in all the state parliaments. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a protest vote. The people of East Germany, they just, you know, they are more nationalistic. They are, uh, they, they are resentful, you know, of the West Germans. Also, you know, imagine, uh, I have a whole talk on that. <laughs> I have a talk on, it's called post-election review. I'm working on this one, but I also have a talk on the unification because it is, Ah, they so got the short end of the stick when you think of it, because they have lived for 40 years in socialism and then for 30 years in a country that told them, ah, you know, your skills, we don't really need them. Whatever you think, we don't really need that. You know, you shouldn't get too much money. You shouldn't get too much unemployment. You shouldn't get too much social security. You shouldn't get that. You shouldn't get this. And so um, nowadays, we are entering into a new era of 
um, wealth transfer in West Germany. So every year we have $275 billion that are being transferred from one generation to the next. So unfortunately not I, <laughs> because I come from poverty, very sad. But I have friends, you know, people who have like a master's in philosophy that and everybody knows that that's not where the money is, but they live in a million dollar apartment. Why is that? Because they're only children and they have grandfather, grandmother, father, everybody's giving them their money. And this is not great for the East Germans because all of this is only happening in West Germany and in East Germany, none of it is happening because they were living in socialism. And so all of that is not boding well for Germany's uh, future. And we have a situation now that people in East Germany, a sizable portion, I think it's like 47 or so percent who say, nah, democracy, I could take it or leave it. And to, to have that is not good, you can imagine. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Point of in uh, around uh, 99 or 2000, I was teaching for an American company in Berlin. Oh, wow. And uh, after class one day, went to Checkpoint Charlie and the museum there and went through it. There's one room there where it's almost like a religious experience where they're showing videos of all the time uh, before the wall came down. And, uh, you know, the, the part about the you know, what life was like. And it was so quiet in there as I was, as I was watching the people. Uh, and, you know, it, it was just, just a, the only way I can describe it was like a religious experience is that people were just so silent and listening, you know, and it, maybe some of them reliving it. Second point is that uh, on one of your, uh, your pictures, you had a picture of all the, uh, the cranes and all the construction going on. I couldn't take a, a good picture there in Berlin because all those cranes were in the background. <laughs> right, right, right. There was so much going on. It was really uh, quite incredible. And then, of course, it was this playground for all the architects, you know, Renzo Piano, wow. David Gary, every, uh, no, Dave, no, Gary, Frank, Frank Gary, uh, Daniel Liebeskind, all of the, the most famous architects were coming to Berlin. So it's a very exciting city. I mean, I'm, I do miss it. Um, but, you know, it, it was a time, you know, it was my, um, it was a phase, you know, where I, uh, for 13 years I was living there. It was a long phase, <laughs> but I'm now happy being in Florida because I love palm trees. <laughs> Let's see, what else? Another question. Yes. You mentioned, you mentioned that uh, the people feel that they're in East Germany feel that there's no need for their skills and all that. Was there ever any um, education or retraining offered by the government to help the people develop their skills or change their skills? Yeah. Like I'm trying to do in the United States with the people um, in some of the less skilled jobs here. Yes, definitely. I mean, there are people who are who who have been doing uh, re retraining for so many years, you know. And uh, you also have there's also um, the structural. I don't know how how you would say it. You know, you know that uh, Virginia. You know, Joe Manchin. He always right. says, "What are we going to do with the with all these people who are in the in the mines?" You know, and of course, uh, that is the same thing. You know, this uh, this idea of and then of course, as a as a government, as a politician who wants to win, uh, yeah, elections, you have to be very careful. You know, and so um, it, because of of all of this, you know, the, the industrial jobs. Uh, so East Germany had an industry. Yes, granted, it was an industry with 
machines from the Weimar Republic. Imagine, they had machines from before Hitler, like machines from 1930. And for 60 years, they were like tinkering with these things, you know. And then 1990 comes. And then, of course, there were several big uh, mistakes that were being done in terms of, you know, that they, that the, the currency union was terrible, you know, that the, the East Germans wanted the Deutschmark, which is understandable. If I don't have any money and then somebody says, here, you get some, some Deutschmarks, you know, that was also, I mean, the fact that they, they also wanted to have consumerism, you know, after so many years in socialism. But of course, the East German, the fledgling East German economy wasn't at all ready to kind of have such a, such a strong currency as the Deutschmark. So that wasn't uh, happening. Then, of course, you have the raising of the wages. Everybody now then had wages that were too high for the productivity. And it was all, it was such a, such a mess, you know, and then... And then, of course, the industrial sector. And this is the time of globalization. This is the time when the West German uh, people are saying, let's go to China. That might be good. Because in China, they only want one euro per hour. Whereas here, they might want 20 euros per hour or so. You know, And so um, that is why uh, out of 100,000 industrial jobs, 10,000 were left. And out of 4 million jobs that they had in 1989, in 1992, 1 million was left. So 75%. There was also investment was there in, in the uh, in East Germany, you know, in that time period post 1990. Did you say what investment? Yeah, was there an investment? I mean, yes, you said it, that they were moving to you know, the rest of the world was going to China. Yeah. But, you know, was there in that 89, 90, 2000 time period, was there any investment at all in East Germany? And oh, yeah. yeah all, what about the labor force? Were they yeah. able to transition out of the socialist mentality into a um, industrial mentality? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. The productivity, they had, they, they needed a long time uh, for the productivity. So in 1989, the productivity of a West German worker was exactly 37% of that of an, no, uh, the productivity of an East German worker was 37% of that of a West German worker. Wow. 2019, so like 30 years later, the productivity is now 75%. So it has got, gone up, <laughs> you know, so the East Germans are working hard, but they are still 70, 75 or so percent of what the West Germans are doing. And so there was, there was a lot of, um, um, a lot of, money, you know, there were like 2 trillion euros that were uh, transferred from the West to the East, you know, because we were thinking we can just like, throw money at the people and then money at all the buildings and then everything will be fine. And uh, but it, it didn't work out as well as we thought. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then of course you have the East Germans that, and, and they are also many East Germans are are just like resentful, and um, they sometimes have a little bit of a point, you know. But then at other other times, you know, it has been thirty years, and no, and you know when it comes to the young kids, you know, people who are now thirty, they haven't even lived in an East Germany, you know, they only lived in a unified Germany, and they still define themselves as East Germans. Isn't that incredible? That I always think is so incredible. Hmm. Very interesting. Can I ask a question about the Jewish population? Yes. Uh, is there a significant Jewish population in East Germany or are they mostly in West Germany? Uh, the significant, um, when it comes to the Jewish population, the significant number would be in West Germany. Um, if you would count Berlin, uh, as East German, you know, we could like, hmm, you know, we could say, I mean, it is in East Germany, uh, geographically, we could then say, yes, I mean, West, uh, uh, West Berlin, 
um, has uh, the biggest amount of Jewish people in all of the German cities, but it's mostly um, in West Germany. And there was quite an interesting, and that's another talk that I have, the Jewish life in Germany nowadays. There's quite an interesting, uh, yeah, uh, a trend that happened also in the 1990s, and that is that Russian Jews were coming to uh, Germany. And not only, you know, Russian Jews, when the Soviet Union was falling, they were coming to Israel, to uh, the most of them were coming to Israel. Then the second largest number came to this country, to the United States, and then uh, we had about 200,000 who were coming to West Germany. And that really kind of uh, gave the, our West German Jewish community this kind of big uh, resurgence in a way, like the Renaissance, and um, yeah, it's an interesting topic. Is Germany giving a pension to Jews coming back to live there? Uh, yes. Uh, for, well, it depends. So uh, if you were, um, let's say, for, for example, those, those Russian people, yes. So because we, we do have a, a social net and it's, uh, it's not as great as it was when I was growing up, but it is still uh, one of the better ones, you know, when it comes to Europe. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so even if you were, because many of these 200,000 people who came from Russia, um, when they came and uh, s settled in West Germany, many of them were over 40 years old. And that is for the German, German, uh, you know, in, in our German um, workforce, 40 years already, people are rolling their eyes. <laughs> so, you know, it's really terrible. It's a very youth oriented market. And then in many cases, they didn't speak German. So they were really in, in a bad situation. And that's why many of them never really um, got any footing, you know, professionally. And so that's why they then um, were dependent on uh, Social Security or on unemployment payments and so on. And that is something that um, the government pays. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Um, I think earlier on someone asked, but this could take a while, but um, someone asked about the interesting escapes over the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I am not the biggest expert when it, when it comes to these escapes, because this is really something that you would get at the Checkpoint Charlie Museum, because that is uh, dedicated to, uh, to the wall and to the escapes. Um, but there were, when it comes to, on a somber note, I can tell you that um, over 100 people actually died by um, uh, by the hand of of these terrible border guards, you know. Because and the, one of the first ones was a young man who was 20 years old, and this was in a very early 1962, and uh, he wanted to kind of walk or kind of jump over the wall, and then they they shot him, and. Uh, so there were, you know, there were, when I was growing up, there were always, like in the late 80s, there were these stories, uh, and then we would see them on West German TV that, like, a family built a, a hot air balloon. <laughs> so, like, very clandestinely, they got all the stuff for their hot air balloon, and then they r rose up in the air, and then they, they were, of course, then f fl flying from one side uh, to the wall, but that was not Berlin, that was more like this inner German border, you know, from one part of Germany to the other. And then, of course, they were coming into talk shows in West Berlin, so uh, in West Germany. So that I remember. And then, of course, the, you had a tunnel. When I was st studying in Berlin, I had a friend whose father was one of the people who uh, ran through that tunnel. And then uh, he was one of the last ones because then um, the the East Germans real or the, like the soldiers realized, oh, there's a tunnel. We have to quickly close that down. And yes. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope so too. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna.